this Tuesday. Gotta head to Council Watcher. Have your uh, eye clicker ready. We're gonna do some clicking at the proverbial wazoo today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I want to go over with you. I have to get the line there. Um, I want to go over with you some uh, concepts concerning exam one. Now, exam one, 50 points, is going to be 1030 a week from today. And uh, so let's talk about that. Um, we're going to um, have a exam one, first of the three midterms. And a lot of students always ask me, Dr. B, are we going to have a study guide? And I always say, no, nah, I'm not going to give you a study guide. You are going to have the study guide because I want you to think of your lecture notes as your study guide. And the way I explain it is usually uh, this way, that of the million and one things that I could talk about every day, in other words, I could talk about Galileo for an entire semester and still have plenty of things to talk about. And so, but every day I have to make a decision. Okay, what's, what do I need to cover? What, can I, what do I have to leave out? So whatever you see or hear in lecture is something that I consider to be primary importance. So think about lectures as my statement of primary importance. That makes your lecture notes your record of what's primary importance, i.e. a study guide. That is why you take notes. You're not taking notes so that you can, you know, develop your wrist strength. You know, you're taking it so that you can remember the things that I uh, think are important. So, uh, and, and so think about that as the center of my, the, the lecture is the center of my communication to you. It is primary importance. Now, it's all in YouTube, all right? And so you can use YouTube to review and sharpen up your notes. Matter of fact, uh, one of the TAs that we have had in the past, Darian Fry, uh, she made uh, an emphasis on, when she was a student in this class, she emphasized uh, to her, for her own study to always review the YouTubes. And when she became my TA the following semester, she always emphasized with the students, you know, use YouTube, it's a good, good study tool. Now, that's not the only thing that we've got to think about. Secondary importance, uh, homework, yeah. Uh, so expect to see stuff that reminds you it won't be identical, but having done homework, you'll be happy to see some of the things, hopefully, uh, that show up on the exam. I can't tell you what's going to be on the exam, but homework and clicking, our clicker questions, will definitely give you a, a flavor of what you'll see on a midterm and what you'll see on the final. All right, so um, also, um, I don't always cover every syllable in the textbook. So if, there's, if you're reading, the, you know, the text, textbook's fairly quick to read. If you're studying that and you say, oh, you know, he did talk about that in lecture uh, or something like that in lecture, then make sure you study that paragraph, All right? So think of the... Uh, textbook as uh, uh, 
back up to the primary important communication, which is lecture. All right. Now, any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, I'll, t I'll cover that in a minute. Another question? I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, it's just about the study guide issue. How do you access the YouTube thing? Will you type in, there's a link on the, the home page. You may have no, have you been into the webs? Into the, yeah. I mean, I didn't want to, you know, put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a link on the home page. Just click it, you, you get to the. Now, uh, Maria's here to talk for just a minute about the SI review. To. Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maria and I'm your SI leader. I sit down here every Tuesday class for your uh, lecture and then I host my sessions which were posted at the beginning of uh, the presentation and I'm also going to have next Tuesday, no next Monday because your exam's on Tuesday, next Monday my regular session that was from 3.30 to 4.20, it's going to be a review session. So it's going to be a little bit longer. It's going to go from 3.30 to 5, and it's going to be in a different room. It's going to be Nicholson School of Communication, room 108, because I'm expecting a lot of you guys to show up. It is a little bit different from regular SI. If you've ever been there, instead of usually an SI, you would come in with your questions and things you want to go over for the review. I will be posting a review guide. It's not a, as Dr. B said, it's not a study guide that you should only use that. It's just for, for me to see, uh, to get the session organized and to go concept by concept so that we can clarify any questions that you guys might have. That being said, don't hesitate to ask any questions during the review. It's on Monday and your test is on Tuesday, so you should not wait until that day to study the material and review everything. Today I do have two sessions, one at 2 and one at 4.30. You can find the times on web courses as well. We've been covering mostly homework, but if you do have any other questions, feel free to come bring your textbook, bring, bring any questions that you might have. Even if you've been to an, another session in the past, every single session is different. And if you like studying in groups, it's like a big study group. And even if for some reason you can't make it or you can only make it to one session today, make sure that you go and that you find people um, that you can study with. You can create a group me or just get together and study throughout the week to make sure that you do cover all the material. I will be sitting here if you have any questions at the end, I will be running, so please just make them short. But I will be having, again, two sessions today, and the review guide will be posted on my website. And you can find that if you go to discussions on web courses. There's a discussion called SI. And at the end, you're going to find my times and also the, the website link. And once that's done, it's not done. It won't be done until the end of the week. Uh, I just want you guys to create your own study materials and then you use that to see if maybe you missed anything or to amplify on that information. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. It's going to be posted on the website and you can find the link on web courses, on the discussions. Anything else? Yes. So I'm, I'm not posting anything because we're usually just using the board, but you can get together with other students who are actually going to SI and ask them to get their notes. But the answers to the review guide won't be posted anywhere. You have to go to the session. Thank you. Yeah, and just to... Uh, add to the answer to your question. Um, if you, and this is for everyone, if you cannot make it to the entire session, Maria, right? 
Just come to the time that you can make. So if you can't come until 4, then get there at 4 and, you know, benefit from the last hour. If you can't make it except for the last 30 minutes, go for the last 30 minutes. It'll help. Okay? And, and um, the other thing that I'd point out to you that Maria kind of alluded to is my number one study suggestion. You know, students, especially after exam one, Giovanni, they, they come and they say, Dr. B, how can I get my grades up on exams? I got blazed on exam one. And what I normally tell them is um, find a study partner. The key is to be able to think, think on your feet, so to speak, about the physics um, concepts and equations that we have before us. So you're not so memor. And what I mean by that is memorizing that you do in other classes like anatomy class or history class. Yeah, that's nice, but it's not going to really help you a whole lot. Because my stuff is going to be uh, a whole level above that. Memorization, regurgitation. Yeah, it's nice, but it's not going to help a whole lot. What, and I, so the way that I always describe it is to really crush my exams, which you should make your objective. The way to do that is to think, to be ready to think, read carefully and think. And the best way to learn how to do that is to study with another human being. Now, you could study with me in office hours. That's number one. You can study with Maria in SI sessions and the SI review. And if you do go to SI sessions or the SI review, you can meet friends there that you, oh, I didn't know you, you know, somebody from the morning, the early session, the early lecture. Oh, I didn't know you were in there. Let's study together. Okay. When can you meet, you know? And, you know, group me, I have mixed feelings about group me. I mean, I like you guys, you know, talking to each other and group me and stuff, but you know, we had we had some cheating related to group me in the summer, and the students got. I just got one of the reports back from the Office of Student Conduct, and it was really bad. The student really got pretty stiff punishment, in addition to, you know, what we did academically. But, uh, but I mean, if you just want to have a study partner that you can meet, you know, at the library, um, you know, after class or. Before class, by the way, if you're here early on campus, um, you know, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., this room doesn't start. We're the first people in here. The 9 o'clock session starts off, all right? So if you're here at 8 and you have a friend in the 9 o'clock session, come at 8 with them and have a little study session. And I'm usually here 7, 7.15, and if you're studying with your study partner and you have a question, I'm right here. You can come up and, you know, ask me a question. All right. So, but the, the thing about having a friend, another human, is that you, you're going to talk about stuff. Just kind of like, kind of like it, when we're doing clicker questions and I always say, all right, consult with your neighbor. The reason I emphasize that a lot is that, I, you know, the, uh, the whole idea, iron sharpens iron, that old saying. Um, speaking with another human being, for most of us anyways, you have to engage your mind before you speak. Now, some of people, they, they speak before they engage their mind, but, but most, most of you guys, you've got to think about what you're going to say. And that is how you learn how to think. And you can get, tr and if all you do is... Uh, uh, if, if all you do is, is just study by yourself, that's okay. But if you get off on the wrong track on something and there's nobody there to, you know, kind of mutually correct you and stuff like we do in class, you know, uh, you know, that's not su such a good situation. So that's always my prime uh, directive to improve your grades. Find a study partner or a bunch of study partners, study group. Okay. And, you know, Maria is a good study partner. I'm a good study partner for office hours. 
Uh, and, and classmates are really good. You know, the other thing is a uh, virtual study partner is everybody that's in discussions. So if you can't make it to SI, you can't make it to my office hours, and you don't have any friends, you can always go into discussions. And people, you know, like Tiffany, I think she's in the first hour, a uh, bunch of people. Tiffany, are you here? <coughs> Tiffany. Uh, anyways, Tiffany's from the first hour, and a bunch of other people I know are, are pretty active in there, giving good tips and stuff like that, which is great. All right, so that's kind of a virtual study partner. All right. Now, a student up here in the front uh, asked me, Dr. B, what do we bring to the exams? Well, first thing, you bring the raspberry colored Scantron, the one with the UCF Pegasus logo. 50 questions on the front, 50 on the back. Now, the midterm, we're going to pretty much fill the front. All right. Now, you, uh, bring your eye clicker as well. We'll have a few eye clicker questions, usually mm, two or three, three or four eye clicker questions, and they'll be for multiple points. So you might have three uh, eye clicker questions, two points each. You know, like a calculation of uh, drop distance, a calculation of a velocity, uh, stuff like that. And, uh, and so, that, so if that's six points, then that means the other points that total up to 50 are 44. So that means you'd have 44 Scantron items and then six points worth of clicking items and totaling 50. All right now, just so you know, uh, the rule of thumb, when I first got here, you know, I'd never given an exam uh, on Scantrons before. And because I, I had been teaching in smaller schools, and so I asked my, ball, my chairman, and he, he said, yeah, the, the rule of thumb I go by is one multiple choice question per minute. And that's usually enough for, you know, a multiple choice test. And so we have a 50. So if I was going to give 50 multiple choice questions on the Scantron, that means I would give a, at minimum 50 minutes for the test. Now we're officially going to have 60 minutes for it. But if you can get here and bring your Scantron, bring your pencil and everything else, uh, and we get started a little bit, you might have, you know, 64 minutes, you know. So, uh, so get here on time. But the, the exam will be 50 points and usually an hour is going to be enough time for that. And you'll probably have, if we can get going fast, you'll have a little bit more than an hour, which is good. Okay. Um, also, let me repeat the rule of getting here late. The getting to the exam, you know, a lecture, getting here late, it's, it's no skin off my nose, no skin off your nose. But getting late to an exam is not a good idea. Because my rule is, and I've put it, I think I put it in the syllabus this semester. If you're late by one minute, I'll give you the test. You come down to the front, we'll save a few seats up here in the front and then, you know, for the late comers and we'll get you started. If you, you know, and so that's not a problem. You just have a little bit less time. But if you come, after the first person turns in their tests and leaves the room, you may not take the exam. I'll tell you, you're too late. You can't take the test. All right. And that'll be your dropped exam. So the way to avoid that, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not a disaster until you've done it more than once. So you don't even want to do it. So just be uh, on time and everything will be copacetic. You, you know, you get plenty of time, and and if you're late, I, you know, because I, freshmen, newbies, do not look for a parking space for 45 minutes. I've had any number of students come in, and, you know, I can't give them the test. Oh, Dr. B, please, because I, I couldn't find a parking space. Tough toenails. You know, you've got to you got to be more organized. You, you you guys that are sophomores, you know what I'm talking about. Parking spaces are hard to find sometimes. 
especially on the middle of the day. Uh, so just plan on, you know, riding the shuttle bus up to school or links or whatever, you know, but you got to get here on time. There's no, you know, there's no exception for, oh, there's, there's no parking spaces. You know, I can't, I, I can't do anything about that. You've got to do something about it. Okay, bring a good pencil and bring an eraser. You know, so these pink rectangular jobs that you used in fourth grade, yeah, those are good. Uh, because I've noticed that with cheap wooden pencils and cheap mechanical pencils, uh, the eraser is really bad. Like if you go to a dollar store and you buy some pencils, and they've been sitting in the back of the dollar store for like six years. The erasers are like rock. So if you go and erase, oh man, I, I want to type in, I want it to bubble in C instead of A. It's going to wear a hole in your paper. You can't do that. You can't go around with a hole in your Scantron from your eraser. So get one of these good little pink jobs and that'll be good. All right, that's what I use. Calculator, good. It's a TI-30X. Uh, I saw a student, uh, I was working with a student in another class uh, yesterday. She had a TI-30X. I said, where'd you get this, the bookstore? No, I got it at Walmart for eight bucks. Okay, so if you go to the bookstore, I'm sure they'll charge you 38 bucks, but the way those got, except I love the bookstore because I know there's some people in here that work there. The bookstore, they're so tremendous. They're lo I love them. They're just, you know. The best, the best bookstore of all time. But anyways, <laughs> but bring a calculator like this. Even one of these big monster graphing calculators, you know. You better know how to use it, though. That's all I have to say. Uh, and if you don't, then you're going to do it in pencil and paper uh, like in sixth grade. You're going to do a little long division and whatnot. There will be space for scratch work on the test. You know, so like a lot of times the very last page is blank or the page before the last page is blank. So uh, you'll have space to do scratch work. But if you don't have a calculator, here's the thing that you may not ever use. The cell phone. You can have it on you, but it's got to be in your pocket. And we'll be watching, you know, every semester – or two, I see a student, and that's it. You're using it. You got a cell phone out during the test, you know, and you're checking your group me because your buddies from group me are posting their the questions from the first test. That's it. No mercy. You're you're gone. All right. And we'll be watching. So just have a regular calculator, and you don't have. You don't have to, and don't use your cell phone. All right. Now, another thing that students sometimes, and I'm, I'm surprised nobody's asked me about it yet, is uh, what about formulas? Do we get a formula sheet? Or do I have to fill, you know, like engineering students, they get to fill out formula sheets, you know? Any engineering students in here? I think there's one or two. No? There's a guy up in front here, he went like this. He was trying to fake me out. Uh, you, are, you actually are an engineering student though, right? No? Okay. Well, engineering students, they always have, if you, if you ever know, raise your hand if you know an engineering student, an engineering major. And you know, those guys, they write these formula sheets on little index cards. You know, the, the, the equations are like, you need a microscope, but they got them. You know, all in one little index card that they're allowed. You don't have to do that because what we do in this class, we do formula matching. And so you'll have all the formulas that you need in a short three or four questions of a matching nature at the beginning of the test. And I'm going to show you how it works. Uh, so get your clicker out. We're going to do some clicking. Uh, if it's the first time that you've used your iClicker in this class, hold the power button down for two seconds or so. The upper left rectangle will flash and then type in DD, delta, delta, for our frequency. And then you'll get the go nitro message and then ready. And then you're ready. Now here's what, when I say we have formula matching questions, this is kind of what it's going to look, I mean, it's, it's going to be 
not quite laid out this way, but basically here's three questions and you have to match a question one, question two, and question three to one of those four formulas, A, B, C, and D. All right? And so your formula matching, and this is usually the first three, four questions, five or six questions, you know, depending. And, uh, and, you, and, it, and it's the equivalent to a formula sheet, but yet you don't have to memorize. All you have to do is recognize, oh, yeah, that's, that's the free fold drop distance formula or whatever the formula happens to be. Because the option will be there for you. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll put the formulas on the left and the concepts on the right. But in any case, you're going to get points for recognizing. You don't have to memorize, and you don't have to, you know, write down those little index cards like the engineering majors. All right, you don't want to do that stuff. All right, so we're going to do a, a couple matching questions, and uh, these three uh, on the eye clicker. So if you're ready... Um, uh, let's get started uh, with the uh, three uh, eye clicker uh, matching questions. Okay, so here we go. Question number one, definition of acceleration. Click in your answer, A, B, C, or D. Whoa, you guys are blazing. Woo, 167. Yeah, but do you have the right answer? That's the, that's the thing. 200. Oh my goodness. So many students with clickers. You know what though? I, I have some bad news for you. Some of you that are clicking, I think you haven't registered it. There's a significant number in here that are not registered. You better get it registered for the, t for the test. Otherwise you ain't going to get Jack. All right. 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, 212 votes. And yeah, C is the correct answer. Most of you got that. Um, so you'll see something like that on, on exam one. It might, you know, it might not be exactly looking like this, but it'll look something like this. Let's do number two, Newton's second law. Now we haven't done this one yet. Uh, so let's try this one and I'll give you a hint it is not D and we've already done C we've already used C so it's not that one either so 30 seconds Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, okay. Yeah, eighty nine percent of you got this one right. Uh, 10% of you voted, one person voted for C and one for D. If you voted for B, um, that's, that's like a drop distance, that's a drop position formula. That's the Y coordinate for a drop uh, for a dropped uh, water balloon or something. Okay, so that can't be Newton's first law. So, and most of you guessed cor correctly on that one. Let's do another one. Galileo's new state of motion. Which we've talked about. Interesting. And here's the here's the the kicker on these these matching. Now sometimes I'll have matching that's not formula. You know, just concepts. 
you know, matching concepts and stuff. And here's, here's where, you know, you get to the kicker. Okay, 15 seconds. If I give you a matching where one of the answers can be used more than once, that's when your brain starts to fry. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, but that's not this one. This matching, there's only, you know, you're only going to use A once. So those of you that just voted for A again, no. Now, Galileo's new state of motion. Constant velocity, no unbalanced external forces. Net force is zero, yeah. Um, and actually, I hate to say it, the morning, the, the 9 o'clock class uh, did better than you guys by a few percentage points. 48% uh, have it correct here. 50% voted for, for, uh, for B. And that's, you know, that's, you know, a, uh, a free fall, but that's not the, the breakthrough that Galileo had. Galileo had uh, constant velocity, net force zero. His law of inertia, that was his breakthrough. Um, so let me click out of this. Now, keep your clickers ready. We're going to do some more clicking. And before we get deeper into the lecture, let me point out a couple other things. Your first assignment in the Great Rivers Learning ebook website is going to activate at 12.05 p.m. today, so a few minutes after class dismisses. It will be due uh, on Tuesday next week. And so think of it as a, it, it's a mini review, and think of it as a study assignment. All right, now it's not ginormous. Uh, in other words, it's not huge. But it's, it, it's, it's a good smorgasbord of questions, tackle them. And then there's a lot of other stuff. We're going to do some more web courses homework this week, you know, probably over the weekend. So you, you got, you're going to have plenty of stuff to study. Um, now, uh, the uh, couple things I want to mention about this, um, here's, here's what it looks like. So to get to it, you want to get to the bottom of Chapter 2. Okay, get to the end of Chapter 2. And then hit the next button. That's this one right here. Okay. And that will take you to the chapter two mini review. Now, this is what it looked like this morning before lecture. But when you click on it at about 12.05, 12.06, it'll start showing you questions. And you'll just, you know, click answers and stuff. A couple of them, you'll type in a number. And remember... If I ask for you for a distance in meters, I, I don't want you to type in the word meters or M. I just want the, and this is the same on exams, the same in web courses. I'm going to always just say type in the numeric part of your answer. And then I'm going to tell you to what precision, you know, how many decimal points of precision, if any. All right. So, but you never, so it's always going to be a number of some kind. Oh, by the way, if you type in a negative sign, you have to type, if, you, if, if, you, if you're ever in web courses, I don't know about this site, but if you're in web courses and you have a number between 0 and 1, you, you know, so 0 0.228, you can't type in 0.228. It'll mark it wrong. You have to Type in zero first and then 0.228. And the same on the eye clicker. If you have an ant, and I usually design eye clicker questions so they don't do that, you know, so that you don't get an answer between zero and one. But if you do have that, sometimes you do, I remember that you have to type a zero and then the decimal point. All right, so this is what it looks like. And here's what it looks like in the assignments page. Now, up above here, you can see homework zero at the very top. Um, and then down here, chapter two, mini review. And I'm going to separate those on the assignment page. Now, in the grades, they're all going to go into the homework grades, the homework grade aggregate, the total homework uh, activity. So this is going to be 
Uh, I think it's set for 12 points. Okay, and it's one of the bigger assignments that we've had so far. All right, so that's what it's going to look like. And what I'll do, some websites, like over the summer, we use the textbook from the Wiley Publishing Company, and they have, have a website called WileyPlus.com that allows students to do homework from that textbook, and WileyPlus.com automatically downloads stuff into web courses. Uh, but Great River Learning does not do this. So you may, you may be thinking to yourself, Dr. B, I've done the assignment. I got 12 out of 12. How come it doesn't say that in web courses? And the answer is it, it has to wait for me to upload the, those grades in web courses. And I won't do that until after the due date. So after the exam next Tuesday, you know, like Tuesday afternoon or something, I might upload those homework scores into web courses. So I'll download them from Great River as a spreadsheet, mess around with them a little bit, and then upload them into web courses, and then you'll see it. Okay, and you'll see it on the grades page. All right, so. Questions about that? Great River homework. Question. Why can't I do that? Well, it's, it's part of the required materials for the course. So you don't have to buy it. You know, you don't, everything in here is voluntary. You know, grades are voluntary too, man. You do whatever you want. You know, if you don't want to spend the money for it, that, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call the cops on you, you know, but, you know. It is crazy. But, I mean, well, you know, if you don't want to buy the, I, all I'm saying is if you don't want to buy the book, you don't have to buy it. I mean, it's, but it's not going to, you know, it's, it, we got homework to do, so it means you're going to not be able to have. Okay, well, that's, the, that's the answer. We're, we have the book, and that's, you know, that's, it's designed to be study, to have study assignments in there. Go ahead. First exam, as I already mentioned, it's going to go all the way through as much chapter three as we can get to this week, from introduction up to, you know, three point something. You'll know on Thursday at the end of the lecture. Uh, but, and here's here's another thing to 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 add to it. There's there's going to be a chapter mini review for every chapter. From chapter, there's not one for chapter one, but for chapter two, three, and on out. Um, though, but we're not going to assign the chapter three mini review prior to exam one because we won't be through, we won't finish chapter three until after exam one. So, so we'll use the chapter three mini review after exam one. So, but they're all in there. And uh, we're still debugging, I think chapter three is debugged. But uh, does that answer your question? Good, okay. Another question. Okay. Um, so in the, in the future, you're gonna see more web courses assignments, like the, the three that we've, actually four that we've got right now. And then you're going to see more in Great River. So we're going to have a bunch of each and uh, at various times. All right. Now, always on, I'll try to announce it when they're posted and stuff. Okay. Um, let's talk about hidden figures and accelerated motions. Uh, and I want you to hit the... Um, uh, hit the refresh key. We're going to switch over to short answer questions. Okay, so hit refresh, and I believe that will bring your eye clicker up to uh, the letter A. Got it? Hit the refresh key. You should have letter A. All right, and then you tell you know, and then you go up and down and. Then you go to the right, choose another one and stuff. All right, now here's your question. 
We're going to go to the doc cam in a minute about this figure. Go ahead and write this figure down in your notes. And then type in a word or a short phrase that describes the motion of this object whose vertical velocity graph, Vy, is shown. And think carefully. I can hear clicking. Very good. The sound of thinking. And we'll take a look at some of the answers. Actually, let me start looking at them. And I'm going to mark everything. Type in what you think is good, and I'm going to mark everything correct here. Kind of like if it's a survey question. On survey questions, I usually give everybody. Except I see a couple, I see a couple misspellings here, but I can figure out what they are, I guess. That's correct, okay. And don't forget to hit the send key after your answer's in. Oh, somebody just changed their mind. Good. Don't forget, you can... Oh, some of these spellings. Uh, you can change your, um, your answers. Just... Ooh, this one's in Spanish. Nice. I think. Oops, here's something. Yeah, this is good. Some of these are good. All right, one minute. Get your uh, clicker answer in. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, let me. Let's go and take a look at some of these answers. Um, okay, I don't know. I think this is supposed to be accelerated. I don't know what happened with that one, but, um, but, you know, this is misspelled. You know, I'm not going to grade you for spelling, but curved. That's actually a pretty good answer. I like that. Two people voted for that. Decrease. Hmm. What's decreasing? I wonder. 
uh, down. That is, that's, I'm going to grade it right, but that's actually not correct. And it's not falling, it's, it's rising. And yeah, it's fast and getting faster. It's because it's gaining velocity. Going up, yeah, that's good. Going up and slow. Uh, no, it's getting faster. Because the graph is, is getting taller. Gradual, gradual increase. Yeah, that's not bad. Now, I'll go back and grade these uh, all a little bit later. But um, just to remind you, it, if we have a question like this, on exam one or any of the exams coming up, uh, I'll be able to go in and give you partial credit on something like this too. You know, so so like for instance, if you misspell the if, if the correct answer is acceleration, and you you misspell it, you know, that's all right. You get it. And here's where's that one that was in Spanish, accelerating rye, uh, right. Uh, incorrect. That's accelerating <laughs> H. Upward. Uh, there was one here. This is Espanol, except this is the letter Q. So, but anyways, I'll be able to spot all that stuff because I'm, you know, I'm a human, so I can figure out stuff that a computer can't. So keep your clickers ready. We'll switch back to YouTube now. Um, and what I want to do now is uh, we're going to go onto the uh, document cam and we're going to do a talking PDF um, uh, for this curved graph. This is not, uh, this is not a distance triangle it's it's it looks like a triangle but it's not a triangle because it's the top of it it's curved you know the hypotenuse ain't a hypotenuse it's not a line segment but we can handle that and i'm going to show you how to do that now let me pause so uh let's review uh the hidden figures it's based on at least this problem now they did a lot of other tasks <laughs> in addition to calculating distances and stuff like that. I mean, that's, I mean, one of the things that Katherine Johnson's famous for is calculating the position of John Glenn's space capsule. Now, it wasn't quite like in the movie. You know, the, the movie they did at the last minute, you know, he's out there at the launch pad, give it to Katherine Johnson, you know. And in reality, he actually did ask for her by name, but it was like two weeks before launch. It wasn't, you know, the day of the launch. But it is Hollywood, so they juiced it up a little bit. Anyways, we know all about, you know, distance, rectangle, no problem. Constant velocity. Uh, simple, smooth acceleration like free fall. Yeah, we got it. Distance, rectangle, 1 half GT squared. Ding. You know, use a minus sign if you're figuring out a position. Just use positive 9.8 if you're just doing a distance. And we got that. But, you know, a complex acceleration like we just studied? Yeah, trapezoids. That's all you got to do. And those are made up of, as Joseph said, a rectangle and a, you know, triangle. You know, so, but the thing is you want small delta T increments because basically you're, you're pixelating up your curve. You know, in, in theory, the curve is a continuous... It doesn't have any straight lines to it, right? But you can approximate it pretty good uh, with small delta t's. And then you paste them all together and you get your, you know, your distance or whatever it is you're trying. And there's other physical tasks that you have to do this same numerical calculation process, all right? Raise your hand if you've had calculus class in, in here. Okay, if you, if you remember the, the concept of integral, that's what we just did. We integrated a curve uh, for a function that we don't know, for which we, don't, we can't look up the answer uh, of the integral in the back of the book, which is what most of the time we do. So um, in those early days of NASA and before World, you know, during World War II, and up until, you know, the 60s and then on up into the present day, 
That's what they, and now they have computers. But in, in the days of Katherine Johnson, in that movie, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, and everybody else that wasn't in that movie, they were moving from the days when the computer was a human being operating a pencil and an eraser and an adding machine to the days of an electronic computer. Just in the middle 50s, the 1950s is when all that stuff came out. As a matter of fact, uh, Dorothy Vaughn became the per one of the people that figured out how to use the computers to do the job that she used to do by hand. And because when you're trying to put somebody on the moon or just put them in orbit and get them safely to back to the Earth, boy, you don't have much room for error. So they had to use a lot of small delta T's and a lot of computations. Here's a picture of Katherine Johnson. Long may she reign. And she's still alive. She's 100 years old this year. Her birthday was just a few weeks ago. God bless her soul. And that's a picture of her um, up at the White House getting the, the Medal of Freedom. She was 98. Still going strong. And uh, here's the book, Hidden Figures. The author, Margot Lee Shetterly. I think the book is more interesting. You know why? It's, it's interesting because she goes back. You know, the movie starts in the 1950s. But the book goes all the way back to like the 1920s. And these women in the movie, she does in this book, explains that entire culture of segregate. Well, not doesn't explain it, but gives a very good description of that entire culture of segregation. You know, Jim Crow, separate but equal, you know, whites only, you know, all that stuff. And Virginia, where hidden figures took place, was one of the, what, probably the worst of all those uh, segregated states and stuff. Uh, back from the Civil War. So, um, so it's, it's really good. And I, I'm actually reading this book right now. And uh, I highly recommend the book and the movie. Uh, you can learn a lot. And it's, it's very uh, inspiring. The movie's inspiring and so is the book. Uh, so I, I recommend that you uh, track it down. All right. Now we have an accelerated system, you know, that kind of curved velocity graph. Uh, Acceleration increasing, the steepness increasing. You know, so it's not just getting faster, it's getting faster at getting faster. It's a curved graph. Now, um, we can ask ourselves, what is it that causes acceleration? Well, we, we know all about free fall near the surface of the Earth. You know, that's just the gravitational force between the Earth and, and the object that's in free fall, you know, an apple uh, or a baseball. And even the moon is in, did you know this? The moon is in free fall around the earth. Yeah. It's way out there. And it, it's, it's so far out. And it's got so far to drop. It never makes it to the surface of the earth. But yeah, technically it's in free fall. It's so far out that it, it, it drops. But it doesn't take, you know, a parabolic trajectory to the surface of the earth. Because the earth is so far away. And it just keeps curving around. And it, it actually has a circular orbit. But. Yeah, it's technically it's in free fall. Now at the surface of the earth, 9.8 meters per second per second, 9.8 meters per second squared, and that's pretty much everywhere from the top of Mount Everest down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And if you do precise measurements, you know, you'll pick up, a, you know, a few digits out past 9.8. You know, so, uh, you, you know, so if you're flying... You know, if you're in a plane with a, gra a gravitometer, something to measure gravity, and you're flying over the Himalayas, um, you'll see various, you know, it might go 9.807, and then five miles away it might be 9.806, and then five miles past that it might be back up to 9.807. And geologists use a gravitometer for prospecting, you know, for large-scale prospecting. And one of my teachers when I was in high school, Mr. Caprio, God bless him, uh, he was a geologist. He said he retired and became a school teacher. But he, he, was a, he, he prospected for oil. The oil that's, that they found in Alaska, he was in the team that found it. He also prospected for uranium 
And he described that this is one of the ways that they find uranium, gravitometer. Because uranium is a really heavy metal. So if you fly over a, for, a rock formation with a lot of uranium in it, it's going to be, it's going to change the G of gravity to 9.808, say, instead of 9.80. So uh, that's one of the things that they do. But pretty much every, it's, but 9.8 is pretty much everywhere. If you go out into space, it's a little bit less. All right. Now, some systems like the rocket launch that we just talked about, you know, Mary Jackson and all those guys at NASA, you know, they were working up in Virginia, and the, the launch complex was down here in Florida, Kennedy Spacecraft, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, those are, you know, changing accelerations. Yeah, so the space shuttle. You know, and, and I'm going to show you some data from the space shuttle here. But one thing, you know, if you've ever watched a film of the space shuttle or any of those big rockets at Kennedy Space Center, you know, the, the, the rockets fire, ignition, and then a second later, lift off, and they start moving upward, and they're, they're not re really moving that fast. Not yet. You know, so they have these, these really ultra-strong bolts holding the rocket down, until the rocket the motor develops maximum uh, burn rate, and then they unbolt it, explosive bolts, and it starts moving upward. Lift off. And, uh, but it, it's, it's not, you know, it starts at zero acceleration, and eventually it, you know, zero velocity, but it, it gets uh, faster and faster. We're going to look at some data. It starts small. Uh, one of my professors at, uh, in grad school, he uh, was a shuttle astronaut. And I, I went over to ask, you know, I was working on a problem. And I went over and asked him, um, Dr. Acton, Lauren Acton, God bless him. Long may he reign. Uh, he's still out there at Montana State. I said, Dr. Acton, how uh, big is the biggest acceleration when you're on the space shuttle? And he said 3.3 Gs. In other words, 9.8 times 3.3. That's about the maximum. They designed the space shuttle to, you know, to st the, the, the engines and stuff to not go any further past that. You know, they can do, you know, some systems they can accelerate past that, uh, but not the space shuttle. So that's about 3.3 Gs. All right. So the question is, why, why are there these changing accelerations? And uh, what we're going to find in chapter 3 is the beginning of the answer. In other words, Newton's three laws of motion. Now, what I want to show you here is um, a table of data that I found on one of the, you know, the NASA's got all these um, student pr programs and, you know, educator resources and stuff. And I found a fairly nifty table of data from a real um, uh, shuttle launch, STS-121, which is, I believe I looked it up, it was in 2006. And here's, the, here's what the first page of it looks like. And then down below that is a table. Here's the table. Now, don't worry about writing down this table. You can look it up if you want. But do look at it. Notice anything about this table? Look at that first column. What's delta T? It's 20 seconds. So this is gigantic delta T's. A real NASA table that Katherine Johnson would have calculated or Dorothy Vaughn's computer would have generated. A thousand, between every one of these lines, tens of thousands of calculations because they got to know high precision. Because one little um, variation, that thing could go off course and, you know, crash. You know, you don't want that. So we got these huge 20 seconds. So make a note of that, huge delta Ts. And look up here. I, I told you that they start out fairly modest. Yeah, that's less than a G, 2.45. You know, that's 
small fraction. a matter of fact, that's a quarter of a G, isn't it? 2.45 times 2 is 4.9. 4.9 times 2 is 9.8. So that's a quarter of a G. But eventually, right about here, it gets to maximum. And then down here towards the bottom, it goes to zero. But look down here at the bottom. Down here, you all, you're way past uh, 24. You're up here at 29 uh, meters per second squared. Now, why is that? Well, one of the things that they have to deal with is uh, something called dynamic pressure. All right? And this is the formula. Go ahead and write this formula down. It's fairly simple. We're not going to calculate with it, but we do want to talk about it for a minute. Um, in this formula, the symbol rho, that's a Greek letter rho, lowercase rho, uh, that stands for the density of the air through which the rocket is moving. See, if you have a lot of air, it's going to have a lot of air resistance. If you're going through a vacuum, rho is zero, no air resistance. Uh, hey, you guys, how, does the, how would you describe the variation of the density of air? What makes air density vary? What do you think, uh, Rachel? Rachel? The higher you go, in other words, altitude. Yeah, altitude. What happens if you get up there to high altitude? There's, le there's less of it, right? It's, le it's, it's less dense. What else happens up at that altitude to the air? Yeah. It's colder. And the humidity changes. Things evaporate at a different rate because the air pressure is less. So that affects the speed. If you're going through thin air, you can develop a lot more speed. So all these things are changing. Now what we're going to do on Thursday, uh, we're going to talk about Newton's three laws of motion and we're going to cover all three of them. Your homework assignment is to go to SI uh, next Monday. Uh, start working, if you can, uh, on the Chapter 2 mini-review in the Great Rivers website. And also start reading into Chapter 3. You're dismissed.